is born young reading series two, the story of flying. Chapter one, into the sky. Not so long ago, people were stuck on the ground. They could only watch as birds soared above them, but some men were determined to fly. In 1487, an Italian inventor named Leonardo da Vinci drew plans for a flying machine. He was sure it would fly. Ha ha, Leo! It's your silliest idea yet. But he couldn't build one that worked, so no one believed him. Twenty years later, a man called John Damien decided to copy the birds. I shall fly from Scotland to France," he declared. Wearing a pair of wings made from real feathers, he climbed to the top of a tower. But John Damien didn't reach France. He didn't even reach the next village. Instead, he dived headfirst into a dung heap. A French inventor, Clement Ager, decided to copy bats. He built an enormous pair of bat wings and stuck them to a steam engine, but that didn't work either. Some people attached wings to their bikes. Did you ever see a bird with wheels? But they could never pedal fast enough to lift off. Inventors realized they would need more than a few feathers or a bike to fly. They would need a specially built machine. Is it safe? In the 1850s, scientist Sir George Cayley built the very thing. It was a glider that was pulled down a slope. When a gust of wind caught under it, the glider rose into the air. Sir George Coachman sat in the glider for its first flight. He didn't want a second trip. I'm off. The problem with Sir George's glider was that it needed wind to fly. When Felix Du Temple built his, he added an engine. It ran down a ramp to gather speed, and it flew, but not for long. The engine was too heavy, and it soon crashed to the ground. That's torn it. Yet still, inventors refused to give up. One day, they were sure someone would build a plane that worked. Chapter Two: The First Planes. Wilbur and Orville Wright. Were brothers who lived in America. They built bikes, but what they really wanted to build were planes. Their first machine was a glider, like Sir George's. In a strong wind, it could lift off the ground on its own. Orville and Wilbur flew, and crashed, and flew, and crashed, but all the time they were learning about flying. Then they built planes with engines. These had spinning blades called propellers. The blades will push the air back, and that will pull the plane forward. Finally, they had a plane they were sure would fly. They were so excited they tossed a coin to see who would fly first. Wilbur won. He crashed. It took two days to fix the plane. Then. On December seventeen, nineteen o three, it was Orville's turn. Gently, he climbed into the cockpit and started the engine. The plane took off, and it flew. But taking off wasn't as easy as it sounds. The Wright brothers had to build a track and pulley system to help. 
weights were fixed to a rope, which was tied to the plane. Hey, you! Get off the track! Mechanic started the engine. The weights dropped, and the plane shot along the launching track. This helped build up speed to lift the plane into the air. I could use a rope to pull me along. Soon, lots of people were building planes. Most designers used engines developed from cars. In 1909, the world's first ever air show was held in a field near Rennes in France. Yes, I made it up here. Look at all those planes still on the ground. Although 38 planes took part in the show, only 23 managed to take off. There were all kinds of competitions to see who could fly the highest, longest, or fastest. Nice tail! How did he ever think that would take off? Henry Farman won the non-stop flying prize. He flew 180 kilometers, 112 miles, in just over three hours without stopping to refuel. The prize for speed went to the Curtis Golden Flyer, flown by Glenn Curtis, which reached an incredible 75 kilometers, 45 miles an hour. The largest plane at the air show was the Brickwood One. It was as heavy as a fully grown horse, and as wide as a great white shark from wingtip to wingtip. And they said it was too heavy to take off. Many pilots had built their own planes using a wood or metal frame, which they covered in cloth. And most of them had stuck to the Wright brothers' tried and trusted design, the biplane. You can't beat two wings on each side. But the star of the Rams airshow was the pilot, Louis Blériot. Only a month earlier, he had flown his single-winged monoplane across the English Channel and won 1,000 euros. Eleventh time lucky! He had set off from a field in France at dawn, excitedly climbing into the cockpit of his Blériot. Eleven. It was the eleventh plane he had built. Half an hour later, he'd landed in Dover in time for breakfast. For a while, the excitement of flying shook the world, but by 1914, planes were no longer so new. Besides, with the First World War breaking out, people had other things on their minds. Pilots began to fly spying trips across enemy land. Later, they even fought each other in mid-air, though some pilots didn't have much to attack with. We need planes built for fighting, they cried. So plane builders stuck guns on the front. They went on to build bombers' planes, with guns that could drop bombs too. Ready, aim, fire! In Italy, plane designers built Caprinis, which were enormous bombers. These had guns on the back as well as the front and carried enough fuel to fly all day. They also had flaps on the wings and three extra rudders on the tail, all to help the pilot steer as he soared over enemy land. Caprinis are good, thought Anthony Fokker in Holland but I can build better, and he produced a triplane with three wings on each side. Not only could it turn more quickly, it was an incredibly fast flyer. You'll never catch me! I want one, cried the Red Baron, who was a terrifying German pilot. He went on to shoot down a record 80 enemy planes from his Fokker triplane. Chapter 3. 
a lot of hot air. Triplanes were only the start. Over the next 40 years, all kinds of planes were built. Several were so ridiculous, they didn't last long. But planes weren't the only way to fly. Like the first plane, the first hot air balloon was invented by brothers. The Mont Colfiers, who were French, noticed that hot air rises. They had the idea of trapping it in a big bag, which would then float up. They filled their first balloon by holding it over a fire. Their second balloon even had passengers, a duck, a rooster, and one very scared sheep. Soon, the Mont Coltfjords had built a balloon large enough to carry people. They put a fire in the base to keep the air in the balloon hot. Then, in 1804, a balloon maker took the sea to the skies, building a balloon shaped like a giant fish. The captain kept it level by sliding a weight along a rope. I've heard of flying fish, but that's ridiculous. The first balloon to cross the channel had wings, but they didn't really work and it was a much colder trip than Louis Blurriot's. I'm f, -f, -f freezing The pilots worried they'd crash. We have to make the balloon lighter, shouted one in a panic, and he took off all his clothes and threw them into the sea. In 1852, the Frenchman Henry Gifford tried something new. He built a balloon with a propeller, which was worked by a steam engine. It was so large, people called it an airship. Fifty years later, airships had grown to the length of two blue whales. They looked a little like whales too, but unlike whales, their insides were filled with huge gas tanks. Dinner is served! The most famous airship, the Graf Zeppelin, was a flying hotel. In 1929, the Graf Zeppelin flew around the world in only three weeks. People were astounded. Nothing had gone around the world so fast. Then a mysterious fire destroyed an airship and no one wanted to fly them. These gas bags look okay to me. Besides, there was another invention that was much more fun. Chapter 4 Helicopters Flyers and friends had combined a plane with a balloon. The result had an engine like a plane, but rotor blades rather than wings. So it rose in the air like a balloon. They had invented the helicopter. In 1907, Paul Cornu made the world's first helicopter flight, but as he was only in the air for 20 seconds and didn't even rise as high as a man, most people missed it. Over 30 years went by before a helicopter flew properly. In 1939, Igor Sikorsky built his VS-300 in America, and in 1940, he managed to fly it. Igor's next helicopter, the R-4, had space for two passengers. This so impressed the American Navy. They started to build R-4S to use in the Second World War. Helicopter designers went on to experiment with two rotor blades. These helped make the helicopter more stable. It could also lift more, like the Chinook, which can carry up to 44 passengers. Today, helicopters aren't only used by armies and navies. They might be used to help the police keep an eye on traffic or to rush a sick person to the nearest hospital. Can't you go any faster? They are even used to chase escaping criminals, and not only in movies.
one helicopter has been made to lift vast loads too heavy for trains or trucks. The Sky Crane, which is half copter, half crane, can lift loads weighing as much as a house. Hey, when I said I wanted to move house! Chapter 5 Flying for Fun Just 100 years after the Wright brothers' flight, planes, balloons, and helicopters fill the sky. Massive airports have been built to cope with the hundreds of planes which fly all over the world. Thousands of passengers board planes every day, for work or travel, but many people also fly planes and gliders themselves for fun. Gliders are light and very small inside. They also have no engine, which is the only thing they have in common with the Sir George Cayley's machine. It's a tight fit, but I love it! To fly a glider, you must first be launched into the air. The easiest way to do this is to get a tow from a friendly plane. When the pilot is high enough, he'll release the tow rope and you'll be alone in the sky. Gliders float on columns of warm air. After rising on one, pilots lower their gliders and race down to the next. Pilots not only take naps, they take plenty of food and drink on a trip. If they find enough warm air to glide on, a flight can last all day. Where did I put those sandwiches? But gliding can be tricky. It's also expensive. So many people go hang gliding instead. The very first hang glider was invented by an American, Francis Rogalo. In the 1960s, his Rogalo wing is actually strapped to a flyer who runs down a high hill to take off. Look out, bird! That was a near miss. Modern hand gliders have thin nylon wings that trap air underneath them to fly. With a strong enough wind, a flyer can stay up in the air for hours. Even if you don't like kites, you can still enjoy flying. Ever since Rams, air shows have given plenty of opportunities for pilots to perform amazing stunts. Some pilots roll their planes all the way over. Inside the cockpit, the pilot has a very strange view of the Earth. A popular trick that's almost as old as the Wright brothers First plane is wing walking. It's also nearly as dangerous. And I thought tight ropes were high. Flying low is dangerous too, but pilots sometimes fly low down to display their control skills. The most experienced flyers can come so close to the ground, their propellers cut through tape. A few even do this trick upside down. Now that's just showing off. Single planes can do all kinds of acrobatics in the sky. They fly in a big circle, looping the loop, or make the figure eight. Clouds of white smoke trail behind them to show people on the ground exactly where they've been. Groups of planes flying together can be even more spectacular. Led by one plane, the others can fly in a line or make a V-shape in the sky, like a group of flying ducks. Chapter 6 Into Space I wonder how far this one will go. Of course, planes, balloons, and helicopters aren't the only way to fly. Thousands of years before any of them were invented, People in China were launching rockets. But as there are no written records, no one knows how well they flew. Then about 200 years ago, armies began to use rockets in battle. 
By the time the Second World War broke out in 1939, rockets were more powerful. Scientists realized they could use the power of rockets to reach space. On October 4, 1957, the first space machine was launched by the Russians. It was tiny and named Sputnik 1. Just four years later, the Russians launched Vostok 1. Its pilot, Yuri Gagarin, became the first man to fly into space. The Americans decided to join in. A race began to see who would be first to send a man to the moon. American scientists built Saturn V, the biggest rocket in the world. In July 1969, it blasted into space. Soon after that, Neil Armstrong became the first man to step onto the moon's rocky surface. Most of Saturn V was made up of booster engines. It needed vast amounts of power to blast itself into space. The astronauts were squashed into the tiny command module at the rocket's tip. The booster engines fell away as the rocket flew higher. The command module was the only part to return to Earth. Until 1980, all space flights were made with rockets. But, as they could only be used once, they weren't very practical. So, American scientists invented the space shuttle. The shuttle is launched like a rocket, but then the booster engine and fuel tanks drop off. The shuttle's engines take over and it flies, just like a plane. Today, shuttles carry astronauts and scientists into space to repair satellites and carry out experiments. People often live and work on them for months at a time. Shuttles have also been used to put giant telescopes in space. As you read this, astronomers are learning more about parts of the universe millions of miles away. Places that people may even fly to one day.